Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Rachel. Um, I know that we have the slot right before lunch, so I don't want to sort of raise too many existential questions about our impending doom just before you go off. So, um, but really, as Tony set out at the outset this morning, like understanding, mastering, and harnessing the technology revolution is the most important question of our time. And I think nowhere is that more important than AI. So I'm delighted to be joined by Ian Hogarth, who is the chair of the, AI, of the government's AI Foundation Model Task Force uh, and a long-term uh, investor and uh, writer in the subject of AI. Um, and I think what we really want to get across today is both sort of the scale of the opportunities and where are the big risks and how government can begin to make sense of all of that. Um, so you're six weeks in to your role now, um, or give or take. Four. Four, okay, so even fresher. Um, and so in those interactions with government so far, so how are you communicating to the politicians about what is the scale of the challenge and how are they receiving that? I think the, um, the most important kind of uh, foundation is to understand how much has happened in the last decade. So, you know, AI has um, various different inputs, but the two most important inputs are data and computing resource. And in the last... Um, in the last decade, we've increased the amount of computing resource we give these, these systems by a factor of 100 million. And there isn't much else in the world that we've increased by a factor of 100 million in the last decade. And so I think that like, that sort of grounds just quite how much is happening, quite the exponential we're on. And then the other thing that um, I think is grounding is around data. So you know, we have these brain-like architectures. We give them a lot of computing resource. And then the data we give them, you know, we were giving them small amounts of labeled images. That was kind of ImageNet, you know, in the sort of low millions of images. And now we basically feed them every piece of human-generated content we've ever created. And that's kind of the goal of most of these organizations. And so it's a very profound shift. And as those two inputs have kind of have scaled, you've seen a massive step change in the capabilities of the system. So I, th I think that's the, the first kind of important piece of context. And then, of course, you get into kind of what are the opportunities and the risks that that level of change creates. Yeah, I think one of the things I think politicians and I think your general person is they're finding it hard to navigate this sort of exponential growth function in that we've gone very, very quickly from a sort of a status quo of AI is not doing anything to suddenly it's going to sort of change the world to some degree. Um, how do you see that pace of change beginning to develop over the next course of the years, and where do you think it will begin to go? Um, so I think that the, you know, the, the first big thing to sort of say about these systems is we don't fully understand why and how they work. So it's quite a kind of an interesting thing. We basically have these brain-like architectures, which we give supercomputing resources to every bit of data that we can get our hands on. And the, the things that they are then capable of doing, we don't have a scientific basis for being able to explain why they do what they do. And so that makes it incredibly difficult to project forward what we can expect from future systems. Um, so I, th I think that you know, we should think of ourselves as in a pre-Newtonian phase where we basically grow these things but we don't engineer them in a, in a kind of truly scientific way yet. And so, you know, what I can say with some degree of confidence is that um, NVIDIA is going to deliver tens of thousands of um, H100 chips to different organizations in the autumn. That will now enable people to train systems that are 10 to 100 times larger than GPT-4. And we don't yet really know what the capabilities of those systems are because we don't yet have a scientific basis for understanding what will happen. Yeah, yeah. I think probably NVIDIA's share price is one sort of good signifier of the scale of the challenge of what's happening at the moment or the scale of what's happening. Um, so then in terms of this opportunity for, let's say, public services and, you know, despite some of this uncertainty, where do you think sort of the big prizes are for government in beginning to uh, adopt some of these uh, products and services right now? So I think if you sort of, if you, if you zoom out to some of the themes I know that have been discussed today around, you know, the UK's kind of leadership in science and technology um, and the kind of ambition to be a science and, and technology superpower, I think that AI is fundamentally a force multiplier on progress in science and technology. And so, I, you know, I, I was incredibly inspired watching 
um, DeepMind's creation of AlphaFold. And I think that um, Demis and the team at DeepMind do in some ways really, are, they are really kind of um, flag bearers for this idea of let's use this technology to accelerate you know, positive scientific progress. And so by, you know, by discovering so much more protein structure than we had before using machine learning, you know, that is an input into the entire kind of biomedical landscape. And so I think that we should think about this as kind of, we are going to get AI scientists that will complement human scientists and speed up the pace of new science and technology discoveries. And that's an incredible opportunity, right? That means we can, we can engineer new things, we can discover new materials, we can discover new drugs. Um, it's, it's profound. And at the same time, you know, a malicious AI scientist being used by a kind of, you know, a, a bad hostile actor can present new threats to national security. And so it's, a, it's, it's the classic problem of a kind of general purpose technology that is also a dual use technology. And we just haven't had very many of them in human history. Yeah, I guess some of the sort of historical comparisons that people make are basically fire, <laughs> the printing press, uh, the steam engine, combustion engine, and electricity, right? And I think that kind of, I guess that diffusion, which we'll begin to see across the economy, will have quite profound societal uh, effects. Some of them, obviously, as you say, very positive. Some of them uh, will present you know, new challenges for public policy today. Do you think that sort of politicians have kind of begun to understand the magnitude of what is actually happening? Or and if they haven't, how do you think we would sort of best convince them? Well, I think that um, I, can't speak to, um, I can't speak to politicians in general, but what I will say is I think we are genuinely doing something very bold in the UK right now. Um, you know, I, I took this job because I observed what you know, the UK government has decided to do, which is to really try to get to grips with the frontier of this, of this, of this technology, to create a, you know, a, a well-funded, independent um, team that reports the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State to really go for this and to host the first international summit on frontier kind of AI safety. And so I think we are doing something really significant in the UK right now that we should be, we should be proud of. And that's why I've kind of, um, kind of you know, ruined my summer <laughs> to, to, to help out. Um, but, um, but I think it is, a, I think that, you know, more broadly, I think it's a very, very challenging topic. I mean, we have, uh, you know, when you, there, because we haven't had many general purpose dual use technologies, it is kind of, a lot of de novo territory in terms of what you do. And the most helpful framing that, that I've personally kind of got for it right now is to really try to be clear that we don't want to conflate general purpose capabilities and narrow capabilities. And so a general purpose capability would be a, you know, a generalist AI scientist that can produce research you know, that is comparable to a, a, a great human scientist. Something like that needs a different regulatory approach to a narrow tool that can just analyze a particular class of images for you. Yep. And we, we should not conflate those policy proposals. And I think that you know, the more we can try to say, like there's narrow AI that has one regulatory regime, there is general purpose AI that needs a different approach. I think the, the, the sort of, it feels like a more thoughtful approach to me. And I think it's a little bit like um, sort of, um, bio, kind of bioengineering where if you want to do gain of function research on a, you know, on a, on a, on a, you know, um, some kind of harmful virus, you do that in one regulatory regime that involves biosafety labs and a high degree of security and scrutiny. But if you want to work on developing useful new drugs for the public, you have a different regulatory regime with something, you know, that, that goes through a series of trials and, and a gradual process of unveiling it to the public. Yeah. And so, I mean, you sort of made reasonable waves with your FT piece earlier this year on some of the safety side as well. And you've been a strong advocate for this balance between, you know, ensuring that, you know, we are moving forward with the opportunities, but doing it in a safe way and that these things aren't actually mutually exclusive in the same way that, you know, a Volvo is probably better than the Model T than it was years ago and the technological development can happen in that way. How do you think the UK kind of can show the leadership in doing both of those things simultaneously? I think that um, I'll speak to the kind of the work that we're trying to do. So what we're trying to do at the task force is for the first time to build real state capacity at the absolute frontier of this technology. So you know, what I've been doing for the past kind of four weeks is basically interviews with some of the top researchers globally in the field 
and saying, consider leaving your job and coming and joining us inside a small kind of government um, team that is going to really figure out what the opportunity here is for the UK and how to put appropriate, thoughtful, you know, proportionate guardrails around this so that we kind of really capture the, the right balance between opportunity and threat that this technology presents. Yeah, and it's something we very much called for in our recent report on this as well, and getting that right kind of talent, such as yourself, into government. Uh, Sorry, I think the, the one really exciting thing here is that, like, we kind of put this bat signal up and said, you know, if you think this is interesting, come help us. And we've had hundreds of incredible researchers from all over the world recognize that the UK is doing something different here and apply to join the task force. So it's a, it is, there is something special happening in the UK right now with this. Yeah, I agree. And, and one of the things then, thinking about how you actually do that as well in terms of the task force, I guess often public policy tries to then convene you know, more and more sort of talking, trying to get collaboration around that. Is your approach then to actually go and sort of build some of these systems within government rather than you know, just sort of begin to put in some of the policy sort of ideas? Yeah, I think we, we, we want to build stuff that allows for the UK to really have the state capacity to, like, engineer the future here. Yeah. And I think that that is uh, going to take a mix of, you know, kind of classic kind of government expertise and bringing in, like, technical experts from the frontier. And I think it's the map kind of the the combination of those two that will hopefully make something magical happen. And it might be too early to say, but is there anything specific you're trying to actually build within government at the moment? Right now, we're trying to get to a place where we can really assess the, the frontier of these systems for um, a wide variety of risks, but also better understand the opportunities those present both in public, in, you know, in public services and beyond. Yeah, super. And then I know there's the AI Safety Summit coming up soon, um, which the UK has shown leadership on and convening. Um, how important is it to get sort of a wide array of international actors around the table to that as well? I think the, the exact cost list you'd probably have to ask the, kind of the, the, the Foreign Office about. Um, I, I, think the, um, I think it's a really remarkable opportunity because we sort of haven't really had that conversation yet. And so, uh, you know, my job is to, you know, build a team inside government that can produce, you know, helpful insights to guide leaders as they think about what appropriate guardrails look like. Super. And just previously, you've also just talked about like the value of global public goods, and AI is probably the most transformative technology of our time, and you know can offer lots of opportunities for people. How do you ensure that everyone gets the opportunity to access these incredibly powerful tools? I think that is a um, I think that is a really challenging question. I think we've seen a variety of solutions to that. You know, there've been um, you know, these open these API-led approaches like OpenAI. You've actually had open source approaches like um, the way that DeepMind open sourced AlphaFold or that Facebook has, or Meta has open sourced Llama. And so I think um, we're still in the, the process of working out how do you um, maximize access to a technology that also has some risks embedded in it. And I think that's just a genuinely challenging policy question that will, will kind of resolve itself over time. Super. Well, I know we're sort of running up to time, so um, I think that's probably a good place to end it, and hopefully you will succeed in that endeavor as well, and we're here to support. So um, I know we're going to lunch soon, but I'm just going to invite Tony back to the stage uh, shortly just to wrap things up, and uh, thank you very much.